Well, hello, Modern World History students. This is Sanchez, and I have double-checked my microphone. So we are ready to rock, and we were ready to roll for imperialism part two. Now, in part one, we introduced the concept of imperialism. So remember, at this point of the game, reviewing your notes and, again, our class discussions, you should have a sense of the definition of imperialism. Imperialism means a stronger, more industrial nation, a European power in most cases, is going out to parts of the world and taking control, uh, dominating, exercising military force, trying to again taking power politically, socially, and economically over different parts around the world. Now we're focusing on different areas around the globe, looking in parts of Africa, parts of Asia, and Latin America. So looking at our screen, and you already have this down your, oh, just kidding. Looking at our screen, and um, this is already down your pro sheet too, here are some of the countries. So remember in class, for example, asking you again, what are some examples of some imperialism countries? At the top of the list, Great Britain. We asked the question in class, of course, why Great Britain seems to have gobbled up most of this screen right here, um, the sort of pink color. It's because it is the first country to industrialize. But we're going to see that other European countries are soon to follow. And we mentioned, of course, Japan, United States is also on that list. Now, looking at this map, the British Empire in the 1800s, during the reign of England's um, Queen Victoria, who was in power, was immense. It was pretty much covering a fourth of the Earth's landmass, and it's about a fourth of the world's population. Um, this whole period of imperialism, also sometimes you'll see online or... Um, different references. This is known as the Victorian age. Um, so that's talking about in terms of music, um, fashion, different elements. Um, British school children were actually taught during this time period, the sun never sets over the British Empire. Because when you think about it, again, the sun is always going over and again around the fact that um, somewhere across the globe that there is a British colony. Now, one colony in particular that was the one of the most important was this guy right here, which is the country of India. India was kind of nicknamed the jewel in the crown, so to speak, because of its natural resources and the fact that India, which has a huge population, was a perfect place for Britain to sell its products it was manufacturing in the factories. Now at first, one of the first ways that Britain was able to get into India and start taking control or imperializing was first economic. Um, at first, the British controlled a company, it was called um, the British East India Trade Company, uh, and even actually even brought in its own soldier, or employed its own soldiers, which were known as Sepoys or Indian soldiers. Now we're gonna talk about in class and get in depth, but right around 1857, Indian soldiers were getting tired of being bossed around by the company and they actually got, they fought back. They fought back because there were some rumors going around that um, Britain was trying to attack their religion. Um, when this mutiny or this revolt happens, Britain finally um, dominates. Remember, it has the power, it has the technology, it has the guns. And after the Sepoy mutiny, the British government is finally going to really take direct control of India um, away for just the company. Now, after this period, that's where we get to that discussion, of course, that uh, ideological motive where the British are actually going to treat the Indians as inferior, um, discriminate against them. Um, and we'll talk about the fact that eventually India is going to develop that nationalism, but it's not even really till the 1900s where we talk about the introduction and hopefully you recognize this face right here. So this particular individual on the screen known as Mahatma Gandhi uh, was able to finally fight, it wasn't until um, 1900s, or 1947 I should say, that he was able to get India's independence from imperialism. So you can see it was quite many years that India is going to be under British control, imperialism, taking social, political, economic, um, and then we'll talk about that more in depth in class. So India definitely is an interesting story that ties into our discussion of imperialism. All right, next on our list, we're going to turn our attention to the Far East, and we'll be looking at what does imperialism look like in China. Now, for China, the last time we talked about China was probably in seventh grade world history. You talked about the fact that China, during the medieval period, was going through a period of great prosperity, and they were making new inventions, and 
for the most part, China had been very self-sufficient, kind of did its own thing. It had beautiful porcelains and silks, uh, but wasn't really that interested or necessarily needed trade with the outside world. Um, so even though China is a powerful outside nation, um, it's right around the 1700s that China uh, realizes that it's not as powerful as some of its Western European countries. Now, Britain had really tried to push into China. It was trying to trade multiple things, um, but China was continuously rejecting the British goods. Why would we want your junk that you manufactured in factories when we're actually making handcrafted, beautiful products? It wasn't until the British actually found, unfortunately, a product that the Chinese were willing to trade. Britain was growing a dangerous drug, a uh, narcotic, known as opium. Um, it, they were growing it in India, and they started shipping it to China. And many of the Chinese are actually going to become addicted. Talk about that in class. Um, when China tried to make the British stop importing opium, the Britain fought, uh, British fought China, and we actually get into the conflict known as the Opium War. Uh, because of this war, Britain was able to successfully take control of China and after that actually gained control of Hong Kong. China will look at it in class, it, it kind of falls victim to the fact it gets kind of bullied. Not even to mention Britain, but also we can add United States. United States is going to try to force to, uh, China to trade, not to be left out. And then we'll look at there's a series of rebellions. Um, there's something called the Taiping Rebellion, and on the screen right now we have something called the Boxer Rebellion, where we see Chinese nationalists, people that want China to be strong and want China to be independent, are going to try to fight back with that resentment. So China will look at in depth in terms of how imperialism plays out in their country. All right, and then we get to one of my favorite sections, which is looking at what does imperialism look like for Japan. And the phrase at the top of the screen I put, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, Japan is going to, for the most part, again, going back to the last time you learned about Japan, um, Japan in the medieval period had that old school sort of samurai shogun system. Um, it was right around from the 16th to the mid-1800s 18, that Japan pretty much had remained isolated again, kind of cut itself off from the rest of the world. It wasn't until right around 1850s that an American, don't need to remember this name just yet, but Commodore Matthew Perry comes sort of bringing its steamships and U.S. military ships into Japan and basically posed the question, you know, hey, we're looking to trade. What do you guys think? Now, Japan sees what's happening with China and really is posed with a question. Do we trade with America? Do we open our doors? Do we act willingly? Or do we put ourselves in a position um, where we could be like China and we could have these Western uh, countries coming in with their technology and overpowering and taking over our country. So Japan decides we're going to modernize. We're not going to let these guys take us over. We're actually going to be proactive and see what they're doing. We're going to see their technology. We're going to study their military. And we're going to try to become like these imperial powers. Now let me be clear. Japan doesn't want to be... European in the sense that they want to be like them because they're better, but they do want to use the ideas if we want to be a strong country, we got to make some changes. We got to put things back in place. So on the screen right now, we're going to see some of the nobles, more of that samurai culture, more of those shoguns. They're going to lose their power. I think probably the best example that you guys most likely watched in seventh grade was the video that was called The Last Samurai, Tom Cruise. If not, put it on your Netflix list, just saying. Um, and then Japan's also going to develop its industry. It realizes it needs industrial power, it needs guns, it needs steamships. Um, and it's also going to be proactive in actually going out and taking colonies of its own. So remember, when I say colonies, we're talking about all these little chunks of land around the world. So we already mentioned the fact that Britain, for example, is taking all these pink countries. Uh, we could also say again into China, which is going to go into China as well. But China is kind of purple because there's multiple countries. Remember, again, the United States is going into China as well. Um, Japan's over here. So Japan is going to be looking into uh, declaring wars with Russia. And it's also going to look in the Sino-Japanese War taking over Korea. So Japan, even more so than some of these other ones, um, or we could even make connections like Great Britain, is an island. So Japan is in a perfect place where it wants to be smart and it wants to go out and take colonies. 
It wants the same thing as Europe as well. It's looking for natural resources to bring back to the island. Make sure again, Japan has resources. And it's also looking for markets as they develop their industry um, and they build up their military. All right then, and then last but certainly not least on our list, we're gonna go ahead and dive into Latin America. So for Latin America, for the most part, during the 1800s, the Spanish and the Portuguese had colonies in South America and Central America that had finally gained their independence. So a little bit different of a story that we turn our attention to Latin America. Um, most of the Latin American nations were, were weak and at the time controlled by some corrupt uh, military dictators. Um, again, United States connection here. It's around like 1823 that President Monroe, uh, President James Monroe, Monroe, I should say, the United States issued the Monroe Doctrine. And it basically told all the European countries that were going around taking colonies that the United States wanted them to stay out of the Americas. So again, going back to our map right here, so pretty much America, you know, calls uh, this kind of off-bounds area and saying, you know what, guess what, this is our turf, this western half of the hemisphere. Um, so you Europeans, you can stay over here and gobble up, gobble up your colonies and take control, uh, but this is kind of our area over here. Now in the text, we're going to briefly uh, review. I know in 8th grade history, you guys studied the United States um, spreading worst, westward, I should say, fights the Mexican-American War. We're also going to talk about later around 1898, the United States is actually going to fight a war with Spain called the Spanish-American War. Um, which is also, again, United States trying to be competitive, trying to make sure that they have power in the Western Hemisphere. And then the last, how the United States looks out for their interests, we'll also briefly talk about the fact the United States is going to actually help the people of uh, Panama, which is in the Western Hemisphere, uh, revolt for their own independence. And in exchange or return, the pa uh, Panama actually gave the United States a 10-mile wide strip of land in Panama to build the Panama Canal. So maybe you've heard of the Panama Canal. We'll mention it and uh, I think it's on your pro sheet as well, which actually opens in 1914. All right, that being said, that's gonna go ahead and wrap up, wrap up our pro sheet. So reminder of the pro sheet, I've given you pretty much a general overview of the entire unit. At this point in the game, you should definitely understand the basic definition of imperialism. Of course, we're gonna look more in depth um, in class, looking at the motives, exploratory, ideological, political, um, economic, and also exploratory. We looked at some causes, what's causing Europeans to go, and of course effects. We're going to look at the ideological um, component, social Darwinism. We give you a basic definition. Looked at the map multiple times. Remember your mental map of who's doing the taking, who's the imperial power, and who is being taken over, the colonies. We gave you an uh, overview of Africa. We're going to look farther to uh, the east, looking at India, the jewel in the crown. We're going to sail our ships over to East Asia and to China. Um, Japan, which is aggressively trying to be itself an imperial power, and then wrap things up in Latin America. All right, so with that being said, make sure you fill out your pro sheet. You have it ready to go for class, and we'll continue diving into imperialism. Thanks, folks. I'll see you in class.